Come on by and have a bite at the Crossroads Diner, the place where your spirit goes when it's time to change direction. Hey everybody, Steve McCurdy here at the Crossroads Diner, and on uh, with me today is my good friend, longtime friend, Ken Bailey. Ken and I have done a million things together, and uh, we made a dollar thirty-seven on all of them. That's right, together. most of them legal. <laughs> <laughs> I did oh, all of I, all I, of them I legal. Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't I wasn't aware someone was keeping score. Uh, how you doing, Ken? I'm doing great, man. How are you? I'm great. Listen, I'm trying to get this little podcast started. And the idea here is, um, is authenticity, personal authenticity. You know, people all the time are saying, look, just be yourself. And mm. I've always thought, okay, I wonder well, which one of me that is. Uh, and so I've always had a little bit of a, of a challenge and kind of trying to understand that. And there's a lot of people that have, um, you know, kind of anxieties when they, um, are in a group. Or, um, or in a new role, you know, if they're if they're taking on something new, that leads to sometimes um, imposter syndrome. So what we do here is we kind of go back through the decision making process, mm. the places where you know you you think you you know we ask kids all the time, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you right. know, when they're five, everybody wants to be a fireman. Mm-hmm. And um, and from the looks of firemen, that's really that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good choice. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, then it changes and nobody feels like a failure when they decide, no, I, I think I've decided I'm going to be a agronomist, you know, or whatever. What, right. uh, how, how did that, how did that journey go for you when you were a kid? I, you know, I knew I always wanted to be around a microphone or on a stage, but I really didn't know exactly what that was going to look like. And I knew my parents didn't like that idea, but what about you? I mean, you were around photographers doing amazing things. Yeah, yeah, I got to I got to a ringside seat for some really really interesting things. Um I was a pretty shy kid and um I so I but I love telling stories and um right. <laughs> in fact one of my friends uh, in elementary I would tell a story or tell a joke and he would repeat it and he became the class clown only because he was doing my material <laughs> and I was too shy to do it. So um yeah, I, I never, um, uh, unlike you, I never thought I, I never felt, uh, uh, as a, in front of the camera performer, but I, I just grew up immersed in the idea of storytelling through visual arts and, um, uh, uh, that never left me. Yeah. Um, so how did it manifest? You, you get out of high school when, where everything's kind of planned. Uh, what was the, what was the college or the journey after high school? I won't say college because a lot of people went to trade schools. You went to the Air Force at one point. Um, mm-hmm. But what was expected of you, and what did you end up doing? Yeah, uh, I had been accepted. Um, I'd worked on the school newspaper as a photographer, and I'd been accepted to the San Francisco Art Institute for film studies. And um, uh, I was I was pretty keen on that. My parents. Um, I'm a recovering Baptist, and so my parents uh, were very um, um, insisting on me going to Baylor. And so I'd had a cousin go there a couple of years older than me, and we had other family that had gone there. And it was, a, you know, it was a great school, beautiful campus, uh, so many good things about it. I just didn't, I didn't want to go there, and it had almost zero um, RTV or radio, television, film studies. Um, I took some of the only classes we had. In fact, one, one class we had was, was studying, uh, the war of the worlds thing that, uh, right. Orson Welles did when he scared, uh, well, it was, it was the, not, not the film, the war of the worlds, but the, um, 1938, a, uh, the, the radio show. Yeah. Yeah. We had a 33 and a third record of that. And so we listened to, uh, to that and talked about the, um, the social impact and, um, and my grand, I'd talked to my grandmother, uh, about that time. And, uh, she thought it was, a, uh, you know, the Germans were invading. She, they were listening like most people were that night. And, uh, uh, it was a very scary, realistic thing. And I was able to get that from my grandmother who experienced that, that it was a, it was a real deal, but that was about it. I, uh, 
So I was working with this amazing photographer there at Baylor uh, named Paul Courier, who was doing all kind of experimental things. And then because my dad was shooting the, um, the Houston Oilers uh, football team, uh, he was shooting the coaching film for it. He had, he made a, he made good friends with the, um, with the color announcer, um, the guy that did the, the mm-hmm. actual broadcast over radio and television, uh, Frank right. Fallon, okay. who his home station was KWTX in Waco. And so, um, he, my, my, he told my dad that he, they had an opening if I wanted to apply. And so I rushed right over there and, uh, that really changed my life. That was a huge change in my life because I saw while I was there shortly after I got there, we got our first videotape machine and always before that it had been filmed, which was my experience with 16 millimeter film and 35 millimeter film. And so, but finding this new medium was just, uh, you know, we were like, uh, um, uh, some of the, the, the background players in a Tarzan movie, we were just all standing around this, this thing <laughs> trying to punch it. And like the opening to, um, two, uh, 2001, a space, I, you know, we were like punching at this thing and how does it work? And you couldn't see through the tape. And cause before I could always hold the film up to a, a light and I could see frames and I could see individual images of, of that. So, but, uh, you knew immediately this was the future we were, we were looking at. And, uh, Turned out for my life that that turned out to be true, and that became an important part of my life um, throughout most of my life was video. Did you and, editing my? By the time I came into it, which was you know a, a little bit behind you, videotape editing was dubbing. You you found the piece that you wanted and you made a copy, and then right. you queued it up and you made you know so you you it was a copying process. You, the original right. was never destroyed. Um, but I know that there are some people that actually razor blade edited videotape. Did, did you guys have experience with that? I did. I did that with quarter inch uh, audio tape because yeah, me too. Uh, audio was a big part of my uh, uh, audio for film was part of what I I did uh, with the family company, and in fact, they even sent me to Rochester to learn some things, which I didn't do very well, but. Um, <laughs> about film audio for film, you know, optical tracks and all that, which is pretty technical stuff. But, um, yeah, I never cut a video that way. Um, I didn't get to video until we had, um, uh, just, it was very limited editing. Like you're saying, it was, we were butt cutting the, the scenes together, but there was no physical cutting of the tape or anything. Right. So, um, but you had the generational loss for years and years where, mm-hmm. you know, you either had to go back to the head and start all over again or, or make a copy and go down. And then it was generational loss after, you know, and so even on the, the best quality you could shoot, you were still winding up with a final product that was, um, at least was, second generation. Yeah. At least, uh, that would, that would be mm-hmm. fortunate if it was second. Generation. Right. Right. Yeah. Normally it's like third or, third or, third or fourth. fourth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, getting away from the tech for just a minute and going back to motivations. So mm. your your dad helped you get a job. You went to Baylor. I did. And while at while there, your dad helped you get a job in a field that you kind of had some interest in. Oh, uh, by going than, to WTV. <laughs> yeah, I was over the moon to work at a TV station. We, okay. um, we had the first moon, moon when I was there. The first unmanned spacecraft landed on the moon, and um, uh, we were watching that. And, uh, yeah, it was an exciting time in America. It was an exciting time in film. Uh, yeah, it was. I just loved it. In fact, I loved it so much that it really negatively impacted my, my time at Baylor. I um, I spent way too much time there working to sign off every night till 2 a.m., and and uh, my roommate was, was a director there, and, Um, yeah, it was just, uh, I I was in love with it instantly in love with the whole thing. And I got to, we got to do more and more, um, Waco in that, those days, you know, we'd have a Saturday night story that would be about literally, this is true about putting in a traffic light on one of the main thoroughfares. And, (laughs) and, um, I also learned that I learned an interesting thing there that, um, I, I would always carry a, a still camera with me and, um, I was, I was going home from work and there was a, I, I ran upon this house on fire. And so I, I started taking pictures and 
and the firemen showed up and all that stuff. And I went back to, to Baylor to the lab and I, I processed the film and I took it down to the, um, the newspaper downtown because I had these great pictures. Right. And I learned an incredible lesson, Steve. Um, the editor, the night editor looked at my pictures and said, Hey, these are really good. Um, but nobody died. What? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, nobody died. He said, if somebody died, you know, would, would pay you for him and would run the story. And I thought, wow, what a cold lesson that was that, Right. No matter how good my 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 news photography was, nobody died, so my pictures weren't accepted. So, um, yeah, that's that's stayed with me. <laughs> that uh, so your your next career. Uh, so you know you, the cynicism of hard boiled journalism, and yeah, you know don't, don't spend time unless somebody's bleeding. Yeah. Uh, what what? How did you get into the Air Force? Because I know that that was kind of next. Right. Well, um, I was, um, I'd came, come back to Houston. I was going to university of Houston at this point and I was working at channel 13, um, still in television, still loving it and still having incredible opportunities for an 18 year old kid, 19 year old kid. And, uh, I was taking a class at, at I was taking a, a, a number of classes at university of Houston and, I was in this one class that was so stinking boring and I dropped it and uh, not thinking about the fact that I wasn't carrying enough hours to be full time because I was working full time and I was going to school full time. Right. And when I dropped that class, I got um, immediately, I was pretty high on the draft list and I got a draft letter um, telling me I was going to be drafted into the army. So, didn't want to do that. Uh, what I wanted to do was go into armed forces radio and television because that would, again, I thought that would further my career. And, um, so I, um, with a arm, arm with this ridiculous letter from this general saying that I was, uh, that my, our, the head of our station had written for me. Uh, I thought I was, I thought it was all the skids were greased and I was going right into, you know, me and Geraldo were going to head to Vietnam and start taking pictures. And, uh, Turns out that because of the the classes I'd had at Baylor and all that, the Air Force had me um, uh, programmed to go right into uh, the medical as a an OR tech working in the operating room for four years, which I did, which was fascinating. I loved it. Great people. Learned so much. Um, but I was fortunate enough that I was stationed almost the entire time in Austin, Texas, which was only a uh, three hour ride from, from Austin to Houston. So I could go home and work on the weekends if I wasn't on call. Uh, and so I, I continued to work with the family business, um, often, especially during football season when we were shooting a lot of football. So if, if I'm understanding this, um, uh, <laughs> you're, you, you're, you had a desire to work in radio, TV and film. I did. You ended up going to Baylor and tried to find a way to at least get a part-time job doing that. I did. Um, from Baylor, you ended up at U of H, uh, and I'm assuming that that was uh, because you were working so many hours and stuff like that. It was a grades issue that you probably had to then. No, it just an, uh, no. Actually, it was a number of hours. You would think, me knowing me, like you do it would be a grades <laughs> issue, but it, it was actually just the number of hours I was taking. You had to take a, a full load. Oh to be okay. exempt from the draft. And I, um, because I dropped, um, and I, and it was fairly close to the, it was, you know, I didn't have to miss the draft by too many times to, um, to make it to the next semester to go ahead. Right. And, Cause I was real close to getting a, a degree there. Okay. So, um, so, yeah. so, but you're, and so you, you tried at least to stay within what you wanted for yourself. Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. the military being what they are, they're, their decision uh, did not consider your desires, uh, <laughs> but you but you learned stuff there, and and uh, I did, you know. But you did four full years in the Air Force. I did. Wow. Well, less years. less three months. I I got out three months early. Um, Nixon was president, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I got out. Three yeah, months I, early. yeah, I got out a year and a half earlier than I wanted to, for the same reason. It must have been about the same time that we went back and hit Houston together. Yeah. Um, which is interesting that we didn't meet each other for another 30 years. It is. Yeah. Um, but when you came back out of the air force, what did, 
you your interest stayed it didn't move to medical no uh, the only way it the way one informed the other was i did i did start doing more and more work for uh some of the uh, hospitals at the medical center and that sort of thing because i you know i knew my way around the operating room and and so doing, i knew doing what what were you doing filming before? uh okay. we did training films for uh the memorial systems um I did several films for them and um, uh, either in training or marketing, they were marketing a lot to uh, Mexico and, and South America out of those systems that was um, trying to get folks to come up here. It's, it was a different time, but trying to get wealthy uh, people to come, I guess that's still true. They're trying to get that's wealthy yeah, people to come true. to the, to the medical. The so, so yeah, I, um, so, so some of my work in, was informed by my, by the four years, I didn't need four years of training to do those couple of films, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And, uh, but I came right back into the, the family business, so uh, still working films. And, um, but my dad had purchased, um, this multimedia, uh, programmer, uh, to do eight, 10, 12, 16 slide, uh, projectors would be projected onto a, a, a very wide space. And, um, we would do shows. So I, my storytelling, you know, from the time I was four, when I fell in love with television, um, till this time I was still telling stories. It was still visual arts. And, uh, and then shortly after that with, with some, some real success, um, real thankful for the great clients. I was just so blessed. I've been so blessed with great clients all along. It would allow me to help them tell their stories. Um, I went into videotape as soon as I could. And um, the videotape uh, was underwritten by um, by one of my clients, which was Red Adair and Boots and Coots, uh, who told me if I would get the equipment, they would, they would hire me to do um, what I'd been wanting to do for a long time. So that took me off into video production for the next 25 years. And this way you got to videotape and film fires where nobody had to die. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of that. Very good. Yes, that's exactly but stuff, right. But stuff did get blown up. So, you know, there oh, is that. We blew up. Yeah, we blew up a lot of stuff, which was pretty <laughs> exciting, too. Anytime yeah. we were at a convention, um, uh, we're, our booth was always the one where everybody was uh, to see all the stuff getting blown up and fires. And, yeah, it was pretty exciting. And going on, I got to go on a few uh with uh, CBS's 48 Hours, um, I, I took a 48 Hours crew to a, one of our blowouts in Louisiana. And the 48 Hour thing was fascinating because uh, we had the, I'd gotten them there. And um, they, um, one of the ways they, they mediate the fire and one of the ways they, they control the fire, the, the blowout, not the fire so much, but they actually douse the fire. And, um, and this one wasn't on. This one wasn't on fire, so they wanted to leave and go back to New York. And uh, I had to convince them that it was more dangerous, which is true. That it was much more dangerous when it wasn't on fire, because when it's on fire, it can't get more on fire. It's, right. it's it's controlled that way. But when it's not on fire, it can blow at any time. So it can. It's much more risky for it not to be for the blowout not to be on fire and gas and rocks and all kind of stuff are coming out of the hole. So, and we kept them there for enough to get a, a pretty good story out of it on, on 48 hours. But, uh, yeah, that was a, oh man, I love my time with those guys. They were just uh, so much fun to work with. So, yeah. That's great. Okay. So, uh, where we are is, uh, is that we're talking about, um, people at decision points in their life when they've got to kind of, particularly if it's going to be a major change. In your case, you you knew what you wanted. You knew what you were interested in. Mm -hmm. And except for the, the four years in the Air Force, you were able to kind of finagle a job that was in that in that area. But knowing you the way that I do now, I know that documenting what's going on and helping a company tell their story is a consistent job. It's a day job. It works. You can find those clients. But you had this, this yearning to tell human stories yeah, and, um, and to tell life stories, your faith informs some of that. Um, when did that outvote the, the, uh, paycheck 
enough for you to <laughs> just to step into those areas? Well, they they really crossed, Steve. Um, I had a I did a, a magazine series of four four times a year quarterly report for Exxon, and um, they were so kind to me. They let me do um, human interest stories. We we bought the rights to uh, Daddy's Home, and we got to go when the um, Exxon was so great to their employees that were uh, that were called up. There there were reservists that were called up and sent to Iraq, and so we went in and interviewed the families um, when when Dad was coming home or Mom was coming home, and uh, we went to the airport and we we did pre interviews with the family and we got to see the whole thing and then we we got to run this whole montage of um, Daddy's home stuff. It was. Yeah. A lot of tears in that one from both sides of the camera, and uh, uh, and then with that, so with Exxon, I, I got to do all kind of things like that. Uh, one of the things that I did to make things happen was um, there's a company in Houston that's a, called SCI Service Corporation International, and um, I decided I wanted them for a client, so I went to them and told them that I'd written their name on the wall and. Then, what can I do to, you know, ha- I, mean, I was willing to work, you know, to do a film or two for free because I really decided they were a client I wanted and they were, they had started not very far from where I grew up. And, and, um, and we did a whole series of, um, of films. This was, they, they had a lot to do with, uh, with end of life situations and, mm-hmm. and, um, uh, uh, burials and all that kind of thing. And so, but, uh, it was a time when, um, we did a whole uh, series of videos that they would play for people dealing with grief. And um, so I it always, a lot of my work was, was never very engineering oriented. It, it always had a human interest story. Like you, like you said, that was what interests me. Um, yeah. And we had some, you know, you measure success different ways. And, uh, and certainly those, those things that informed, um, where you got to tell the real story. The the cameras are so the football players used to say the big eye don't lie, you know, the the, the camera sees your eyes, it sees into you and it's very difficult for a a politician or a a, a large, you know, a really experienced businessman even uh to uh, to really spin stories. When I would do interviews with um some of the heads of industry they would usually take about eight to 10 minutes just telling me their boilerplate, their corporate story. And, and I would just have to wait there to get to something real. And, um, and that's when the interview would really start. Um, Cause I would chat, you know, sometimes they would say things and I, I know there was and a couple of times I'm surprised I kept my job, but, but I would say, you don't really believe that, do you? And, and then they would defend what they had said. And, and then it all started. And then you could see it in their eyes, the, the, the story started to get very real. So yeah, a lot of those a lot of those stories are, um, they're not untrue. They're just legalized. The, you know, legal has, <laughs> you know, le- legal has well given. Said, yes. Here's the language that you can say. That's but right. But it wasn't the story. This they still had the passion for the true story. Absolutely. But they couldn't leave. They couldn't deliver that sanitized language authentically. Because yeah. it didn't tell the story. Uh, and it's a hundred well, times worse today. Uh, I'm so thankful oh. I'm not trying to do that now because it's so much worse today than it was back then. Right. But even then they were very cautious uh, to how what, what they said. So I had to try to pierce that if it was going to get real. And uh, uh, we were, you know, we, we had some success in that area. Well, this is a, this is a good angle. This is a good little tangent to go on because it actually is, it's on point to me. Those executives who were hemmed in by limitations were not mm. being themselves. They were That's being right. the identity the company required them to be at that point in time. <laughs> That's right. And your point is that not only could you see it, but you felt like anybody looking at the at the footage could tell that. Absolutely or, true. Or Absolutely and I, right. And, and we're at a place in life now where it's very hard to believe anything that's going on because it's very rare to see authenticity. Right. To have something to compare to. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We've seen so many lies that we don't know what truth looks like so much anymore. It used to be very clear. 
and um, and people are so trained and and so you know so many people have lied so long and so much that they've gotten good, gotten good at it. So um, and they may not I, even know that you know what I, they're saying. I think is. often they don't. Yeah, I think you're right. I think often they don't. I think they start to believe the story themselves sometimes. Right. That's really unfortunate. That's why the faith based work that I do is is so much more interesting to me because you know the truth there is um uh, there's a, a, a there's still people that are you know telling stories you know when I was a kid my mom would never let me say lie or even fib it was all did you tell me a story did you mm. she that was uh, the, you know that equated to lies telling a story was the same as lying and I, it's just been real interesting I, in my I, life. I grew up with uh, our mothers were sisters, apparently. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's interesting how that telling a story and the lie of that became my truth later on. That yeah, you know, telling a story was all about truth to me, and um, it, that was it, it a takes transition. Me, it takes me back to, and I can't remember who said this, and you may, and if you do, please tell me. But they were talking about when film went from black and white to color. And this, uh, this, and it might have been Hitchcock, I don't know who it was, said, you know, color is realistic, but black and white is more real, more like life. Yeah. And, um, and it's. Yeah, people it, confuse me with Hitchcock all the time. So I, I yeah. understand your dilemma. That's why I just said it's you said it. <laughs> oh, man. Especially okay. our profile. Yeah. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. So, uh, young people that are um, graduating from high school, uh, graduating from college now, uh, what kind of counsel would you give to them about the temptations that they've got from all sides to make a bunch of money, mm-hmm. um, the temptations that they've got to go be well-known, be an influencer, um, you know, serve their egos? Um, what, what's the, what counsel? You've got granddaughters and a grandson coming up. Right. all of whom are incredible human beings that I've had the chance to get to know and who uh, do a remarkable job of being authentic. Is that, mm. I, I know that you're not going to take a bow for that, that you're going to give your daughter and her Absolutely. husband a lot of credit for that, but they, Absolutely. they have the confidence to be themselves. Where do you think that comes from? Um, well, you know, it's 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 nurture and nature for those kids. It, it, there's some DNA stuff, the, the environment. They were, uh, you know, I, I made a I made a covenant with myself with my daughter that she wasn't really aware of that I would never lie to her uh, if she, you know, no matter what she asked me. I just prayed that she never asked me certain questions, and <laughs> so far I've kind of gotten away with that. Now she's of an age where she can handle the truth. Uh, uh, more than, uh, the folks from uh, a few good men, but, but, uh, you know, one thing that, that really hurt me that, um, it changed something is I was a huge Roy Rogers fan when I was a kid. I mean, huge. And, um, uh, we were shooting back behind the, as I was a kid, I got to go behind the scenes at the Houston rodeo, fast stock show and rodeo is what it was called then. And Roy Rogers was, um, sitting on a, a, a fence, a wooden fence, and he was doing a, a, a some kind of piece into a camera, and there were cue cards, and he was saying things, and it just about crushed me. I thought, how stupid is this guy that was my hero that he has to read? I, I knew everything he was saying. I could, have, I could have done it off. You know, I knew all the things that he said, and he was reading cue cards, and the cue cards really, really affected me. Hmm. and uh got over it and he he got back to my, being my hero for a while but i never forgot that that there was a phoniness about that that uh, i thought he was you know in theater I, I know you get that a lot of people have asked patty my wife who's an actress um do you just make up the lines you know as you go along and um and <laughs> and there's so much programming in our world more now than ever and for a kid, for a young person to, to really be interested in authenticity of themselves, their own calling, what they're, what they're, you know, why they're here and what they're here for. Um, I think, uh, I think it's, it's a very slippery slope now. I think it's so much harder than when I was a kid, 
so many more people are lying to you. There's so much spin. Spin, you know, AI is going to be the the real uh, spin doctor of all. You know, the MAGA, MAGA, well, MAGA, MAGA instead of MAGA, but uh, either one applies. But um, uh, you know, one thing that bothers me about kids today is um, that worries me is this thing that um, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. You know, I, I understand that. Um, I've certainly lived that way often. I've been so fortunate to live that way sometimes, Steve. But sometimes you got to work to get to that place or to get to the, and then watch for the opportunities. Listen, you know, for the phone call. Watch, you know, really be aware of, is this something I could do? And then have the courage to step up and do it. And I, I never, I don't know about you, but I never started the first day on any job. And I, I've had a few, I, I've been real blessed not to have a whole lot of different jobs, but I never went into a job on the first day from dishwasher at Baylor and all those things that I did in the, uh, in the air force that I thought I knew, I thought I was, you know, I couldn't figure this out at all. It was way over my head. I was so far in over my head. I couldn't figure it out. And within just a few weeks, you know, I could do it. And uh, it was, I could, I could list every job I've had and talk about those first few days. And, and you can go into those first few days and that kind of, it can shut you down or you can start lying about how much, you know, or, or trying to spin or, or, or you can also blame other people for why you're not successful. And um, there's so, that's such an easy thing to do that, to come up with all these reasons why you're not getting to do the things that you love and you have to work in this terrible job that makes me feel like less than person. Right. But, but um, yeah, I just, I, I, you gotta, you gotta, you know, you gotta have integrity. I think that's the, I think that's what's missing so often. I think everybody's born with it. I think everybody has it. It just gets, um, you know, it, it kind of gets like an old pair of jeans that get washed over and over. The, sometimes the, the, the integrity wears out of you if you get, you know, if you go on too many rocks and get beat up too much on a rock on a lake so much that the integrity leaves. But if you can hang on to your integrity and keep it in your story, if your story can, can hinge on that integrity, you will be able to do things you work, you love, and you will never work a day in your life. But it doesn't come immediately. It's not given to you. You're going to have to watch for it. And then when those opportunities come, you're going to have to jump on them like a, my grandmother would say, a duck on a June bug. You know, you got to move, bam, and take that, take it, you know, take advantage of that moment. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose, you know. And I so appreciate what you're doing, man. Thank you. I think you're doing a great thing for folks um, with this program. And sometimes, and sometimes what you want is to get you to the place to make a discovery about something else that you want more that you just didn't know about. That's right. Um, so true. Yeah. Um, I, I have a Roy Rogers story of my own. I, I was four <laughs> years old. Uh, I was four years old and I just finished watching a Roy Rogers thing. And I went into the kitchen and my, my mom and my stepfather um, were in there making dinner and things. And I said, uh, I said, Daddy, sometimes when when we can, I want you to take me to Texas. And he said, son, we live in Texas. I said, not <laughs> this Texas, the one with Roy Rogers. <laughs> I didn't so want this great. authentic Texas. Oh, man, that is so great because it's true. It was it was Camelot. You know, it was. Oh, you're, you're so right. It was a mystical place. And and you ran in, you know, later when I was working in New York as a a very young, late teenager, I would run into people that would ask me about Texas. And it was still that mythical kind of uh, Camelot place for people all over the world. It, you know, and, that's and changed. Now, but, you know, it's the butt of the jokes all over the world in, in, some, in some cases. But if you live in Texas and if you are a lover of Texas, you understand that it's, you know, it was a country at one time and it, it became a state, but it's really still its own country That's in, right. in, in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and magnanimous about some of it, arrogant about others. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like every other place in the world. Every proud other of what place. It is. That's, that's right. You know, I, Even Texan, though they don't, unlike Texas, they don't, they don't really have the uh, 
uh, the rights to be be so proud like Texans do, but <laughs> but I, right. I I forgive that. So yeah, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got there as quick as I could. Yeah, uh, yeah. that kind of that kind of thing. Well, um, well, thank you for sharing you know elements of your story with us. The message that I want to uh, to plant, the seed that I want to plant in the world, is that um, what you want is and what is driving you is coming from a very deep place. And until you pursue it, you won't be satisfied. It may not be where mm. you want to end up. It might not be what you're really good at. Uh, I have, as a director, both of us have cast people in shows who shouldn't be allowed to buy tickets to shows. Uh, <laughs> and it's not their field and it's not what they should do, but they need to go through that process to kind of, you know, learn what they are good at, what they are valuable and what they where they can make a contribution. And what feeds their spirit, because what feeds your spirit is very, very important. And this planet's not going to be all that it can be, and our society's not going to be all that it can be, unless a person is doing their best, being their best self. And you yes. can't be any better than who it is that you are. That That's your highest calling. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Well said. And, uh, and so this is a, this is a, uh, this is a journey in, in encouragement. To find out who you are, be that person fully, and make a difference in every life that you touch. And uh, thank you for helping us kind of wander through uh, some case studies of that. And um, we'll probably have you back another time to talk about things like I Flunk Sunday School and uh, and some of your other books that you've written that are um, wonderful uh, collections of characters on a faith struggle, faith journey, because, you know, the idea of um, do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That sounds really, really good. Um, but as you, as you are well aware, there's a lot of work in doing what you love. Yes. Absolutely. There's a lot of, there's a lot of struggle in being in phase and out of phase with that and coming and that I think parallels the struggle with how in phase and out of phase you are with yourself with your intention, mm. with your spirit, and with your purpose. So um, thanks for joining us today in the, in the Crossroads Diner. If we can, uh, Loved it. If we can send you a, a slice of pie, we'll, uh, we'll work a way around doing that. I love, uh, I love that, too. Uh, Always great of, talking with you, Steve. Uh, on behalf of my buddy Ken Bailey, I'm Steve McCurdy for the Crossroads Diner. We'll talk to you next week. The diner that stands at the crossroads of life where your spirit goes when it might be time to change your direction. Look for the Crossroads Diner videos on YouTube and our podcast on your favorite streaming service. Fresh every Monday and Thursday.